How's it going, everyone? Today, I have a special guest, Anson Young, a very successful house flipper out of Denver, Colorado. And I wanted to bring this episode to you because I don't really talk about flipping in the process of doing that as much. And so if you're a new flipper or you're thinking about flipping, this will be a good episode um, on items to consider when, you, when you're doing flipping and some of his tips and techniques to make sure that you're making the most amount of profit. Hopefully you enjoy. And if you don't mind, please subscribe. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Today, I have a special guest. Is it Anson Young? That is me. All right. So Anson is a no newbie to the to the trade of flipping. And so today, we're going to dig deep into the current environment, uh, that being wholesaling, flipping, how to find the right deals, and ultimately, uh, what he's been up to. So how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So give us a quick, you know, 30 second minute long dialogue of who you are, what you've been up to as of late. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm based out of Denver, Colorado. I'm a licensed real estate agent. I'm also a fix and flipper, wholesaler, wholesaler, um, all kinds of fun things. But, you know, uh, mainly working on flips, uh, building out, you know, a, a bigger agent team, uh, working on some projects towards buy and hold uh, later this year. And so, yeah, lots of things on the plates and trying to spin them and not drop anything. So, yep. No, I, I hear that. I have a bunch of things too. And it's a, uh... You're always trying to scale up one thing after another, right? Uh, no, that's cool. So I guess you're, how many deals a year are you doing on the uh, wholesale flip side? Um, I see, I'd say between the two, it's about 35 or so between the two. Okay. And they, uh, what are those, you know, average price points at, at time, time of sale? Oh yeah. So we're, we're well under median home price, which in Denver is about 610,000. And so we, I like to operate in that uh, first time home buyer, FHA, yeah. good school district, you know, kind of range suburbia. And so that that's under 450 um, on those price ranges. Yeah. You know, that's, um, yeah. I, so I'm, I have some land in Arizona that we're developing and I've been toying with the idea of picking up, uh, well, essentially building a community of luxury well, I'll call luxury grade uh, homes, you know, price between 600 plus. But I think my fear has been, well, if the market turns for whatever reason, that's a much smaller buyer pool, right? And so pinpointing the 275 to 350 range is it just a plethora more of, of buyers than the bigger pool. Is that how you, you look at it too? Yeah, absolutely. Like there is no uh, shortage of buyers at that, at that price range, especially right now. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how easy it is to sell, but, yeah. um, you know, if you've got a good school district and an affordable product in a market, that's increasingly becoming less affordable, then you're kind of hedging your bets against a lot of things. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the sales right now is not a problem at all. So, yeah. So, so your, your wholesaling is also in-house, right? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So that's, um, you know, I have a lot of, I guess, well, I don't, not clients, but pe people that I talk to that I, that want to get started in, in, in wholesaling. And it's, it's definitely a grind. Um, I mean, it's a way to make money in a, uh, I guess, grassroots effort. But I mean, what is, what is your take on the whole industry as of, as of late? Um, I don't know. As of late, I've always been kind of this not biggest fan of, of I guess, the, the, the culture around wholesaling or yeah, you know what you see online or the people that you kind of meet sometimes in the business. You're kind of like, yeah. hey. Um, I love. But, the, you know, there's a fo there's that 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 photo on Facebook that they that you see. It's like just <laughs> like the roof's caved in, the house is bent in half, and it says rent ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah, from like misinterpreting numbers or misrepresenting yeah. to um, you know, to to kind of coming off as this used salesman kind of yeah. stuffiness. Uh, I've always just tried to rise above that, um, have a small list of, you know, trusted investors that I sell to. Um, I like to sell infill development lots to developers. Um, anything that's outside of our wheelhouse for flipping, we basically just wholesale. And so it's not a high volume operation by any means, but, um, you know, the, the historical district or if it's, you know, just, just outside of our wheelhouse, if it's better as a uh, pop top, you know, I've got pop top investors who will do that all day long. Whereas I won't touch that on my flipping end. So, um, what is a uh, what is a pop top? Um, that's that's when you kind of the best use for the house is to kind of take off the roof and add a second story to it. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. So like in an established neighborhood, uh, you know, sometimes the best use of that $400,000 house, it's like right between, okay, renting, it's not going to make sense. Flipping, it's not going to really make sense. Tearing it down is not going to really make sense, but I could add, you know, 800 square foot of, of uh, living space and now sell it for, you know, 650, 700, 750, whatever that is. And uh, oh. yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very niche market, but, uh, but it's out there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. You know, I, I have a, I have a team out in Cleveland that does a lot of, uh, a lot of flips and, you know, I would say the last 18 months at auctions and the foreclosure sales and whatnot, they have seen just a number of new, new, new investors coming in and really overbidding for their houses. Right. And obviously that in turn results in less profits for them. Um, you know, and they're, they're making between twenty to forty thousand dollars on a flip, and these flips are selling for like two to two fifty, right? So, okay margins. Um, are you seeing a similar trend where a lot of new investors are coming into the market not knowing what they're doing from the buy buy side? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, just from on the market to just talking to kind of like the bigger wholesalers, the wholesale brokerages in town that kind of cater towards the new investors. Yeah, they're seeing a lot of, of competition for those properties from first time flippers who are um, varying levels of, you know, how much they're going to lose on it. But um, yeah, yeah. But yeah it, it is it is very competitive in, in, in a lot of regards. But yeah, auction, uh, MLS and definitely on the on the off market side, it's getting very competitive. So, yeah, it's um, I, I'm curious to get your take because, you know, I'll talk to a client and they're like, well, you know, Tom, I think I want to start doing my own flips. <laughs> which is great, uh, awesome ambition to have. Um, and they haven't ever used a hammer. So I'm, you know, I'm a little, <laughs> get a little worried. I'm like, well, let me, let me see your numbers. Um, I mean, so if you were starting out as a new flipper, uh, assuming that you had the ambition and some know-how, yep. what, how, how best does one go to the market to find deals? Yeah, um, for a market like mine, which I'm thinking is quite a bit like Austin, uh, you know, I haven't used MLS for, for deals, you know, going on there to find deals for three to four years mm -hmm. that, that dried up a long time ago. Um, you know, auctions are, are tough. We have uh, hedge funds that kind of play at our auctions. And so can't, can't compete with the billion dollar guys. Yep. And so, uh, you know, I would say off market is, is your best bet to, to, to try to find anything. And, right. So, yeah. So you, I mean, I would agree. I, I, I see people pitching the idea that the MLS still has deals, but it's, um, I, I'm sure there's one or two here and there, but there's not a, lo a long list of deals out there right now. Yeah. Um, especially when inventory levels are at historical lows, um, you know, so yeah. So, okay. So your, your, your recommendation would be if you're serious about flipping, understand how to wholesale or put up bandit signs or, you know, work your neighborhoods that, you know, um, so what do you do? Do you do like uh, letters? Do you do signs? Do you do door to door? What's your process? Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's evolved a little bit over the years. I've never used bandit signs. They just don't work here. Like you just don't find them B between ordinance. And I think their efficacy. Yeah. I've probably seen one bandit sign. I, I see like one a year and that's it. And then I go to other markets. I'll go to like Cincinnati and I'll see like 20 on a street. Oh corner. yeah. There's a ton. Just, yeah. yeah it, it's weird to me. I'm like, what is this? Um, yeah. So, you know, we used to just do direct mail and now that things are pretty competitive and a lot of people know what their house is worth. So um, you're, you're, you're fighting that uphill battle too, but you know, now we're basically hitting them uh, in, in every way that we can. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a filtered down list and we'll hit them with mail. We'll hit them with cold call. We'll go knock on the door. We'll leave something on the door. We'll, uh, we'll text them. We'll email them. We'll hit them up on Facebook. We'll do everything that we can to get in front of them and stay in front of them until they either sell us the house or they tell us to go away. Yep. So pretty yep. aggressive these days. Yep. Sounds like it. And then um, again, as a newbie, if, if I, if I wanted to take, take down one flip off market, how much should I expect to spend on marketing, um, cold calling efforts, whatever it may be, what's a good budget for me to start on? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. Cause I always, I always drive people towards like, Hey, go drive for dollars and then cold call. Like that's probably your best bang for your buck. And I would say 
you know, every month just between if you're doing like a, a driving for dollars that does any kind of list or skip tracing for you, um, plus your time, you know, you're looking at anywhere from 200 to $500 a month, probably, if you're, you know, con consistently driving, you can obviously drive, get 500 names, um, and then just consistently cold call that for six months. And your initial investment is the first month. And then your time is the investment moving forward. Um, if you're hiring, you know, a cold call company or something like that, it can get pretty expensive. But mm -hmm. I think if you're just starting out, that's probably going to be the best bang for your time and your money. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I think time is, is, is the important one too, because I, unfortunately you have the learning curve against you, right? It, you know, it's not a, well, it, it is, it is a long curve if you start doing the actual rehab yourself. Um, and you'll learn that when you start tearing down drywall, um, <laughs> you come across every house has a new surprise. Um, I, I've come to learn, um, which I, I, you know, I think it's fascinating. It's amazing how much you learn doing one with just, just one flip. You, you learn so much, whether it be vocabulary, what tools to use, how to even bootstrap certain repairs. Um, it's, it's, it's really powerful just to go through one flip and learn so much. Um, so yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I agree. I guess long story short, what I'm saying is for all you newbies out there, if you're really serious about doing flips and wholesaling, uh, time is going to be required. You're not going to get a home run on your first deal. Most likely. I mean, my, my, my first deal, I was in um, Huntsville, Alabama and I bought it off a wholesaler and the, uh, the entire floor was rotted. Now, obviously he, I don't, I don't think he knew who knows. Um, <laughs> And um, I, I ended up uh, making a little bit of money, but I had to do, um, I mean, my, the amount of fear I had when I saw my entire floor gone, I just saw dirt underneath. Oh <laughs> it, was, gosh, yeah. it, was so, it was terrifying. <laughs> so you're going to make mistakes out there. It's kind of part, part of the process, but what is your take? I, I find real estate is pretty forgiving. Um, as long as you have enough spread in the deal, it's a pretty forgiving asset for mistakes. Yeah. I mean, I guess, if you're buying it right, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're hitting, uh, if you're sticking to your numbers and you're like, let's say you're 75% of ARV kind of deal. And uh, yeah, there are, there is a, a bit of room for mistakes there. There's always room for like, Hey, we didn't know, you know, all the ducting has to be replaced and that'll be an extra $3,000. Right. So if $3,000 is the difference between making and breaking the deal. It really wasn't a deal to start That's with. That's right. So if you're, if you're starting with a deal, there is some forgiveness there. And, and even if you get to the end and you came through with a lot of problems, but you learned from those and you broke even, then it's still, you know, if you learn from those mistakes, it's obviously um, not a waste of time because you're, you just paid for your education to, uh, to learn 100%. Mistakes, hopefully not repeat them and move forward, you know? Yeah, agreed. I mean, one mistake on one deal can, I mean, you'll use that learning for every other deal going forward. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's you know, for example, so one thing that I've, I've learned, um, I had a friend that bought a house, uh, a turnkey. And when you buy homes that haven't been used for many months, uh, tr tree roots are probably in the sewage line, right? And when you turn on the, on the house and begin to use the bathrooms, that water flows through and the trees just go gangbusters. And if you've noticed recently, insurance companies are now requiring you to pay extra for the sewage backup insurance, right? Because it's, it's, it's such a common thing that you're seeing on these turnkeys and these rentals. And I tell all my clients, look, when you get a house, no matter if it's a, you know, an owner-occupied home or whatever it is, spend the 300 bucks, hire a plumber to do a saw through the main sewage line. Uh, I mean, the guy that I'm talking about, he, he bought a, a turnkey for like $90,000 $90, in Huntsville. Sewage backed up flooding his entire basement. He didn't know about it for days. Um, it went to the, to, to, to the first floor as well. And, uh, you know, ended up costing him like $45,000. And if he had just listened to the, the initial recommendation to spend the, the, the few hundred bucks, he wouldn't have had that problem. Right. And so my point is those, le those lessons that you learn from mistakes, hopefully they're not $40,000 mistakes, but you take them through every property thereafter. So you become wiser, you figure out ways to build your margin and uh, over time, obviously more of a success, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think some of those painful lessons, you know, it's like, and, and some of it's regional, you know, here right on, yeah. you know, right on in the basement is a big thing. Um, and that may not exist somewhere where there's no basements, you know? So it's like, that's right. That's right. If you know what to look for and you get nailed on it once or twice, then, then you, sh you know, 
putting that into your process and yeah, it costs an extra hundred bucks or whatever, but totally worth it. Yeah. Totally worth it. Yeah. And in fact, that's, that, that's a great point. Every region has it, you know, has its, 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 its own thing. Uh, like here in Texas where I live, the soil does shift and foundations do crack, right. Which is a big one. Uh, up in the north uh, or east in the Midwest, you have the snow and the insulation requirements. Yeah, so you're you're spot on. It's submarket to submarket with their own, you know, unique, I guess, ailments of the process. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we we has to we had to do like termite tests in Arizona, but up here, like finding just somebody to test for termites would be really hard. So. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no on a uh, side note, I was I've been to Colorado or. Denver a few times and I'm, I'm always shocked at how sunny the weather is up there. Like, yeah. you know, you think Colorado, you think snow and just cold and it's, it's, it's like, apparently it has more sunshine than San Diego. Yeah. It has over 300 days of sunshine. And a lot of times when uh, it snows, it'll snow like six inches and two, you know, one or two days later, it's gone, it's gone. because the sun melted it. So amazing. Yeah. yeah. We we're, we're not packed in for like six months of snow, like, you know, yeah. like Minneapolis yeah. or something. But, right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, all right, so I want to talk about the future here. Uh, every day I wake up and I read some news bit that just makes me <laughs> think about a million things. But um, I'm I'm trying to plan out the next two to three years in real estate, and um, I see a lot of uh, a lot of tailwinds. And I just had uh, a pretty well known guy named uh, Marco Cinturelli on from Narada, and he, you know he's he's very bullish ten years out, right? And I'm I'm bullish generally as well, but I I'm looking for reasons not to be, and so. As someone such as yourself taking on these big deals, um, you're getting paid and, and your food is provided by these deals. I, I mean, what are you most concerned with in real estate in the next two to three years? I think, um, you know, two to three years, that's an interesting one. I think that I or I buyers are going to become more competitive. Um, we're, we're obvious, we, we, we see, we probably have a dozen I buyers now in a lot of real estate companies, brokerages are actually snapping in I buyers as well. So there's, there's a lot of heavy competition. And I think that that competition is not going to ease up anytime soon. Um, I try not to be pessimistic about those kind of things, but you know, you, uh, the, the speed of technology is so quick that you might be talking to a seller. Um, even though you did your best efforts to market to them, they called you first, you got out there, you built great rapport, but they pulled out their cell phone and in 10, you know, 20 seconds, they have an offer on their house. That's more yeah. than you could ever pay for it. Um, I think that that's going to become more common. And I think, you know, in the next two to three years, the, the Zillow's red fins, you know, the, all the brokerage, I buyers, the hedge fund, I buyers are just going to become a much more of a problem for us. So yeah. that's, that's the one thing that I, that I can see happening for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I, yeah, I, I will, I'll tell you, I'm, I try to go around an agent, for my development because there's so many homes and I'm not big enough yet to hire someone full-time uh, on payroll. So I tried the, the, I guess, base fee listing from Zillow. It's okay. a complete nightmare. <laughs> they, oh, really? I, I, I see what they're trying to do. I really appreciate it. But to your point, the, uh, the MLS restrictions just came out I think last, last few months, basically saying that um, as a for sale by owner through Zillow, that it has to be shown on a different marketplace. Oh, right. So only, yeah. So you have to be an agent to be, to essentially get access to the broader market. And so I'm in a market that has literally 10 homes available at any given time, like very few. Right. Right. And I should be having offers left and right. And I don't because I'm not on the, the main marketplace. So that I think, well, one, it's one protection for now. I think what the point is, is that the iBuyers will pick up steam. They'll figure out ways to, you know, reduce that commission rate so that they pocket. Um, I mean, I think Redfin now has the 1% listing, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So from a sell side, that, that's interesting, right? And there's places like Roofstock now that allows you to sell your turnkeys um, pretty easily. Um, but I think from the, from the ownership side, that should relate into more price appreciation, right? More buyers more demand in a very underserved market. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, uh, if it's that easy to list your house, you know, they're, you know, they're, uh, and then get it on a, on a marketplace where everybody can see it, then yeah, then, then you have, you're, you're providing the inventory for the market that's, that's demanding it. And, uh, and then, yeah, you have more eyes on it, which is always, which is always a good thing. 
And, yeah. Uh, I don't think demand's going to go away. So, you know, any, any easier way, I guess, to raise your hand and, you know, directly sell to somebody uh, would be ideal for sure. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So I want to, I want to close up here. Talk, you know, talking about the local market that you're in, you're, you're in Colorado, Colorado, Denver, right. And um, it's been hot for maybe a decade. Um, (laughs) And I know prices are pretty high out there. Uh, So what, I mean, when I was there last, it, it, everywhere I looked was a new building. It was brand new. Everything's very clean. And um, so what are you seeing as some, some key trends right now in that area? Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we have, we have kind of a, a few interesting things, but you know, we do have a lot of kind of high rise things that look like they're going to be condos. Uh, but they're actually uh, apartments because we have kind of a builder um, builder risk uh, lawsuits that are going around or have been going around for, for a long time. And so builders are mitigating that by saying, okay, instead of, instead of just taking on that risk for seven years for the HOA to come back and sue us or homeowners to come back and sue us, we're going to actually take this building, uh, use it as apartments for seven years till statute of limitations kind of runs out and then we'll turn it into condos. So that does, I mean, that helps a little bit on housing uh, demand, but not for any kind of, uh, they're not building units for sale. They're just building more units for rent. So it'll, it, it'll, it'll get interesting because we have, you know, affordability issues of, you know, every month, like rents go up, uh, prices go up. So people are getting priced out of the market mm-hmm. every year. And so there's only so much of that, that, you know, a city can usually take before there's a breaking point or people just are, have a mass exodus. So, yeah. I mean, so, look at LA, California, New York. I mean, um, hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I see this same thing here in Austin. Um, I, I mean, just to ha- I mean, the, the amount of appreciation in the last six months has just been bananas. Um, and, and I think that's probably happening in a lot of, you know, unique, cool cities across the nation. So um, good stuff. So, you know, if, if someone wants to you know, learn about flipping or be coached on deals or any of that, could they reach out to you or what is the best way to use you and in, in your knowledge? Yeah. I mean, uh, anybody can reach out anytime and, uh, you know, if I can help in any way, then then I'm then more than happy to. Um, yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. So, so you have no courses, but if you want local knowledge of the market, um, do you do like JV deals or anything like, like that? Yeah, I do JV deals. Um, if, you know, if they want more information about, you know, if they want to support um, what I'm doing or, or want to uh, know more about kind of finding deals, I do have a book out through Bigger Pockets, um, And so uh, it's called finding and funding great deals. And so you can buy it at Amazon right off bigger pockets or uh, Barnes and Noble has some too. So, you know, that uh, I usually point people there if they're brand new or, you know, to to some other resources to kind of do get enough information to be dangerous. And then, you know, kind of come back with some, uh, some more, more things, but yeah, JVs, you know, consulting, we do all kinds of stuff. So, you know, if you you need to know more, you know, we'll see if we can work together for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And for uh, everyone out there, uh, the podcast or the YouTube channel, I will put the book link in the description so you can click it right there and find it on Amazon. Um, Anson, it's been awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Tom. You got it. Thank you.